And good evening. I'm WBFO News Director Dave Debo here tonight to talk about mental health and housing. It's all part of our mental health initiative brought to you by the Patrick P. Lee Foundation. Turns out one of the largest issues that individuals with mental illness really end up facing is the availability and accessibility of housing. The lack of safe and affordable housing really becomes a tremendous barrier to recovery. It can cause homelessness. It can lead to hospitalization and it causes a range of problems once it's inside the criminal justice system as well. So there's a lot to look at here. Unhoused individuals living with mental illness do face a lot of different obstacles. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about what those obstacles are, what the problem is, but also hopefully find a couple of solutions. We're gonna try and figure out what can be done here. We're gonna look at some of the things that are indeed already being done, and we'll give you a chance to ask questions as well. If you're watching along at home on YouTube, which is where you are, of course, uh, just type in some questions there. We'll be answering them uh, a little bit later in the program. But first, I want to bring you our panel of experts. Mark O'Brien is the Erie County Commissioner of Mental Health. They work with a range of contractors to provide services across Erie County. Christine Slocum is also from the Erie County Department of Mental Health. Mark oversees some of the broad policies. She's the person that kind of concentrates in on issues of housing and homelessness. In fact, uh, was, as we're getting ready, I I Googled your name and saw it on a couple of research papers that were all about homelessness and housing issues across the nation. Kelly Dumas is here. She's a licensed clinical social worker. She also is the Chief Strategic Initiatives Officer at Best Self Behavioral Health. They're a service provider for people with mental illness. They're involved in several housing projects in and around Western New York. And Patricia Seifert is here. She's a mental health advocate and a board member of the Buffalo and Erie County chapter of NAMI. That's the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. At the back end of the program, we're gonna take a minute to have each of these people just give away how to access their resources. So if you didn't get all the names, don't worry, we'll, we'll connect you up at the end. But I wanted to start, Patricia, with you. Tell me a story about what you've seen. You work with people who have mental illness. You have probably seen them struggle with housing. Um, what does that look like? Tell me, tell me what you've noticed along the way. Well, what I have noticed is that a lot of the severely mentally ill um, patients or participants, uh, they do not have good quality housing. And by that, I mean housing that is safe, um, accessible to them, uh, I personally have a child with uh, severe mental illness. He has lived um, above a bar in North Tonawanda. And the only thing in the room was a mattress on the floor. Mm. Uh, that to me is unacceptable housing. Uh, you know, there were uh, wall sockets that didn't have coverings on them windows were broken, no furniture, not even a chair to sit on, but a mattress on the floor. And after numerous calls, I still wasn't able to get him anything to help him have a better safe living experience. Um, he uh, is, let, let me ask a little bit more about that. Why sure. is he, why is he there? Was he turned away from other places? Uh, what, to what degree was his mental illness a barrier? Okay, he is uh, paranoid schizophrenic. He has a severe mental illness. He is on injectable medication, but does not always take his oral meds. He is extremely difficult to work with. Um, we have not had him in our home in over 20 years because of his outbursts and his inability to um, keep himself in control. Therefore, housing for him is extremely difficult. He has been in numerous housing situations and once they find out who he is and what his background is, no one wants to deal with him. I'm not saying this is every person, I'm saying this is some people that are severely mentally ill. Um, there are housing opportunities for many other people, 
but it seems in my experience with severely mentally ill people, the housing is far and few between. Um, and if they have dependency on either drugs or alcohol, it's even worse to try to get them housing. It's kind of difficult to put someone in an environment that has a drinking issue along with the mental illness above and put them bar. above a bar. Yeah, so yeah. it's just things of that nature that have um, made it unavailable for him to get good, safe uh, housing. And I imagine that there's also probably an issue there with access to services. Some of the solutions that we're going to talk about a little later are, are places that have services right in the building. He can't do that right now. Uh, no, he cannot. He is because of COVID also a lot of the programs are not being available. He is not a very compliant to begin with. So to get him to go to program uh, is very difficult if he's not medicating himself. He at this point is given his meds to take during the day, but because he doesn't have supervision, there's no one to say to him, it's time to take your medication. So like I said, he gets his injectable and we hope for the best. All right, let's bring in Mark O'Brien, Erie County Commissioner of Mental Health. Also, Christine Slocum from the Erie County Department of Mental Health. I don't know which one of you wants to tackle this, but how typical is what Patricia just told us? Well, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's far too typical. Um, you know, what, what she's talking about is really the heartbreak that any family member, uh, particularly a parent, uh, does. Because, you know, nobody bargains for a severe mental illness uh, when you raise your kids. You have, you have all these hopes and dreams and aspirations. And, you know, so, some of the, the uh, all mental illnesses are not created equal. Some are... Um, you know, some are an inconvenience, uh, it's putting it a little mildly, a dysthymia, a low level depression, a little anxiety, and I'm not minimizing those. But when you're talking about what Patricia's talking about with her, with her son, um, paranoid schizophrenia or any schizophrenia it is one of the most devastating, if not the most devastating, um, arguably mental illness. It's roughly one and a half to 2% of the population and what happens is very, very quickly for schizophrenia, it is, it, is a, it is a disease of the brain as opposed to an affective disorder like depression or bipolar disorder. Those are disturbances of mood. So anytime that somebody has uh, with schizophrenia, there's two types of symptoms very quickly. There's what's called positive and negative symptoms. And positive doesn't mean it's good. If you have a cold, and you have the sniffles and aches and pains and fever and all that type of stuff. Those are positive symptoms. That means we have a range of experiences that now your cold has added that to it. Even with COVID, the, 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 the taste, the, the, all the achiness, all that stuff, it's added to something. So psychosis means a break with reality. You are experiencing things that are, are not there. You're hearing voices, you're having unreal beliefs. Those are called delusions. You're having all sorts of sensory experiences. Those are positive symptoms. But you're also having things like potentially uh, aggression, all sorts of other types of things. Well, the other part very quickly is what's called negative symptoms. And negative symptoms takes away from your ability to function day to day your ability to do your ADLs, your activities of daily living, your ability right. to interact with others, your ability to make sound judgments. And every psychotic break that you have, there's damage to, to the brain. And so with schizophrenia, their functional level keeps going down, their baseline goes down. With the newer level, with the newer medications, fortunately, they are now addressing these types of things that the negative symptoms. So so these are some of the things that it's very common for what she's talking about. And it leaves these people very vulnerable. Then what, and, I, and again, maybe Mark or Christine, then what can be done? Um, Patricia, I want to ask you a little bit later why sure. he's trying to be independent in his own apartment, um, because I think that's part of, part of maybe the equation that people are wondering about. But short of institutionalization, 
what can be done for someone like her son. Well, and I'll kick it over to Christine uh, as well. I mean, deinstitutionalization has happened since 1963 with the uh, Community Mental Health Act. And really with the advent of the major antipsychotics, they were, uh, after the war, um, they were finding they were be able to control some of the symptoms. Some of the newer medications are allowing folks to do this. That's why her son is, is on an injectable. These are longer lasting types of things, but you look at combinations of, of medications. So these folks are left uh, vulnerable, but you're still an individual, even though you're um, suffering from an illness, you know, not everybody with paranoid schizophrenia or schizophrenia reacts in the same way. Some have different mm -hmm. levels of certain things. Like for example, when you add substance abuse on top of it, you self-medicate. Codependency. Code, absolutely, and in, in, in or otherwise called sometimes co-occurring disorders. So you've got two things going on there. Sometimes you'll get aggression towards somebody else and somebody who will destroy, um, you know, parts of a building. All these types of things I'm sure she's heard of and, and have seen. And, you know, the great paradox of being a parent is you raise your child to leave you. And, you know, here is an illness that has robbed them of a lot of their independence and, and, and the personhood, yet it is possible to still have a life. So I'll throw it over to Christine in terms of the resources that are here and available um, that may not be well known. Um, maybe sometimes people have burned their ways through. There's, there's a number of things and she can talk very well about yeah. what kinds of things are there. All right. Yeah, so um, what Patricia's describing is unfortunately really common. Um, I'm the housing coordinator for the single point of access. So residential programs meant to support people who have serious mental illness, such as schizophrenia, all come, all the referrals come to the same point, such that the county can facilitate um, getting the resources. And my wish list always includes twice as many as we have. Um, I guess I'm a little greedy that way, but uh, the need in the community is very prevalent. Um, the assistant housing coordinator and I get a lot of phone calls from people in the community who are worried about somebody who's living in substandard housing like Patricia described. Um, part of the deinstitutionalization that has been going on has included other types of residential supports and a source of hope for me is some changing paradigms about how we serve people in the community who have serious mental illness. So for instance, and I'm sure Kelly can speak to this because she oversees some of these programs, people who are experiencing homelessness and who have serious mental illnesses can be matched to programs that take more of a housing first orientation. It's an apartment in the community, it's case management. And because of these changing paradigms where it used to be like, oh, well, you've gotta be sober or you know, we're gonna kick you out. Um, service providers have figured out that sometimes because of the symptoms that Mark has described and the circumstances, it can be a really long time horizon. We also have in our community, a variety of licensed beds, which is kind of me falling into like New York State Office of Mental Health jargon. But these are facilities that the state licenses. They're usually single site for people whose symptoms are more severe. They include group homes. Um, if you've seen the buildings at like Seneca and Elk, um, that's a single residence. It's like an apartment complex for people with um, serious mental illness. The tricky thing about congregate facilities like that are people whose symptoms um, include more, uh, I wanna say like confrontational behavior, sometimes are not always great fits for those sorts of congregate settings. And that has been a challenge in our community that um, we've all been trying to work together to figure out because you know everyone in our community with is important, people with mental illness are important, and it's important to us to make sure that people get matched to the best that we can to where that where they should be. Um, so we are trying to okay. work towards this, and I'd encourage anyone who had questions to reach out to me because that's literally my job. Kelly, yeah. I, I swear I'll get to you in a second, but I do want to go back to Patricia just for, for a quick moment. Sure. Why do none of these services that have just been described apply or possibly work for your son. And, and then the other side of that coin is, if his needs are so great, address the idea of institutionalization. Okay. Um, he has in the past 
20 years, 20 plus years, has been at um, on Forest Avenue at the Buffalo Psychiatric Center. Okay. He has been on his own in an apartment. We have tried putting him in uh, a group environment. He is not socially, it's like he's, he's 41, but he's 12 at the same time. So he has behaviors that are not acceptable to other people that are in their 30s and 40s. So he gets into confrontation. He is not compliant at all times with medication. He's very, very difficult to place. In my opinion, and this is very hard for a parent to come out and say this, but there is a place in our society for people like him to be at BPC. And I know that I will get a lot of pushback on this, but he is not He's like the little percentage off to the side that doesn't fit in to a little program. It's like taking a box with squares and trying to put a circle in where the square is. Sure. So he's the type of person that I believe would be beneficial for him to be in a facility that is supervised. Um, that there's somebody there all the time when things kind of, I don't want to use the word explode, but they can. Um, he is known to break things. He is known to punch holes in the walls. He's even ripped a door off a door frame. So he is not the type of person that can be in a group home with other people that don't have those extreme issues. All right. So That's all I'm saying. <laughs> to, to some degrees, I think you're saying he's an outlier. For people who are still having these kind of problems, maybe not to the extreme level that he is, Kelly, what uh, solutions are out there? Kelly Dumas, uh, best self. You folks are starting to develop housing units that also have a clinic, if, if we can call it that, a clinical component? Uh, yes, it was uh, supportive services. Okay. Uh, so we've actually been providing housing for over 30 years. Um, one of the, you know, we believe everyone, regardless of mental health or substance use, deserves safe, affordable housing. That's a basic necessity. Unfortunately, Patricia, I, I feel your pain. It is very difficult for someone with severe mental health who also has that aggression piece to house. But we uh, we have one uh, housing unit that's like a 16-bed congregate level or community living style for people who maybe can't reside on their own, who have uh, severe mental health. But most uh, of- is this, is this kind of like, and I, 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 maybe I'm oversimplifying, but when you say congregate of home, I think of a senior citizen center. Is, is that an apt analogy? Uh, well, I may be comparable or to- Or assisted living maybe. It's maybe assisted, like more like a, so it's 24 hour staff. These individuals, they're free to come and go as they please, but um, it's permanent living for them. So they can't manage on their own in an apartment. So they're around the clock staffed um, um, with cook, support services, medication, everything is there for them. And it, it, also, it also has a component where they can be on their own if they so choose or need to yes. be. Okay. Absolutely. They go out into the community as, they, as free will. Um, we do a lot of scattered sites, so we have a lot of great relationships with landlords so that we're able to provide um, a subsidy for a housing apartment, and then we have what's called a housing specialist that goes in and helps the individual become situated into the uh, apartment, um, helps them get linked to whatever services they need, um, assist with transportation, make sure they get linked to treatment, but we don't require that they're in treatment before we uh, provide the housing component. What you mentioned uh, was we noticed uh, over the past couple of years, there was really a need for more safe, affordable housing, particularly for families um, and families with their primary substance use. Most individuals do have a co-occurring situation. So we have partnered with some developers. We have multiple projects that are in various phases of development to bring on more um, housing units from one to four bedroom housing units. Um, and so with that, 
Uh, there will be those supportive units. We will have some staff that are on site to assist the individuals, as well as, um, as I mentioned, typically the housing specialist will meet at least weekly to assist with getting acclimated and linked into whatever services are needed. And um, we try to help them. Many of them are able, if they're able and interested in working, they'll help them with employment or any entitlements that they're eligible for. How many units do you have around, say, Western New York? Uh, we have uh, close to 200 total. And then uh, we it, the approved, so we have a, a six approved projects for additional housing. And um, once those are complete, and a couple of them will go into 2023, but we have two that will be ready this year, um, that will be an additional 150 units. Okay. And Christine, how does that compare to the need? Um, so at, when I heard about those programs, I was thrilled because there's always, always a really high need. Um, okay. So for yeah. instance, the level of housing that Kelly describes, the county has a wait list of literally hundreds of people for it. Um, and we get a lot of referrals for it all the time. Uh, we have a lot of beds, but what um, Patricia's describing and what Mark's describing, like Mark said, um, about what 0.5% of the population, one to 0.5, um, has severe mental illness. So there is, Erie County's got over 900,000 people in it. When you do the math, like we could really, if I told you that like, it's about 1100 beds for supported housing. And it's like, oh, wow, that's so many. But when you consider the number of people who actually have serious mental illness, and when you consider the families and um, other clinical needs that can come with it, like if you're looking for someone to say that we don't need more, like I was the wrong person to talk to. <laughs> um, I agree. I agree with you. I, I, I was going to bring you in, Patricia. Um, can we build ourselves out of this problem? Is it just a matter of more buildings, more beds? Well, I'd like to toss in here. Um, okay, yeah, a little, please. A little, a little if, if any one of you wants to jump in, no, by no, all no, means, that's just great. Um, you know, as, as as Christine said, I mean that that one point five two percent. That's for schizophrenia alone. So if you talk about the other mental illnesses on top of that, and there's a difference between those folks who have a, a diagnosable mental illness and are able to continue to function in society, or those who have what's now called seriously mental ill and used to be called seriously persistently mentally ill. And so um, just for a little context, um, the, the demand is, the supply is probably always gonna be exceeded by the demand. Um, and I wish that wasn't the case, but just for a little perspective, um, you know, I, I, I hate to admit this, but I've been working in the mental health system for 40 plus years. And I started out in housing, in residential program, um, an agency that's still in existence today, transitional services. I started out as a overnight counselor, went to a day counselor, supervisor, et cetera, et cetera. So I have worked in all those things where we had those folks on site in, in, in those types of things. And you see all those types of things. And at the time, it was really essentially two agencies that did it when I started out this transitional services and Buffalo Federation of Neighborhood Centers, uh, BFNC, and they're, they're still both here. And then DePaul, which was out in Rochester, moved into the territory and, um, and they really expanded. Then you had other providers who were not traditionally residential providers like Best Self, who's, um, you know, used to be Lakeshore Community Mental Health Center Right. In, in the catchment area system um, who really have expanded their mission in, in many ways, part of which is the residential options and also the ACT teams. They do the assertive, assertive community treatment teams. There's been a real combination of it. And now, I mean, there's, there's a total of, if I'm looking at Christine's stuff correctly, there's 1137 um, unlicensed beds and there's 826 licensed beds uh, of various types and ilks and of, of various qualifications, this kind of stuff. Do we need more? 
Abs absolutely. And, you know, you, you, you have major challenges because, um, you know, these folks are usually economically distressed. Um, they're, they experience behaviors that are some people scary. Um, and, you know, you also see that they're at the low end of the economic um, type of uh, continuum. Um, there is a significant representation of people of color. You've got you've got everything going in there, and and you and in communities that there these facilities, you know, to, to go in and build a new um, residential program, you get depending on the neighborhood, you get a lot of pushback. Sure. You know, it's like and okay, well, we want good housing from them, but but not here. Not, yeah, no, I, not, in, the, not in our neighborhood. The next item on my list, I was going to ask about stigma. Oh, you um, you but, absolutely get that, and 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 Kelly, I'm sure could really talk about it when they go through citing issues, and you know, and and the comorbidity of mental health issues and substance abuse because a lot of these folks are in pain, and they're in pain that they didn't ask for, and you know, nobody grows up and says, "I want to be a drug addict." Right, it doesn't happen. But they, they go down to this for various other reasons, and they will run into a lot of community pushback at, at various points. And then you see them congregated into certain parts of, of the, the city. It used to be over in the Elmwood area mm -hmm. on, the, on the Lower West Side. You get some of it in the, in the Fruit Belt with the, with the BFNC, but you get into some of the residential neighborhoods, and they're not going to want they're not going to want this. So you have a great difficulty citing these things. It literally between the time that you go from um, proposing to getting the architecture to get to going through community meetings and stuff, things, you're literally talking years to get new um, facilities up up on the board. And and the, the tragedy of the whole thing is mental illness is an equal opportunity employer. It, 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 it knows no age range, gender, you know, color, this type of thing. It could be your kids, my kids, your, you know, and, and anybody. And, and, and that's, that's the hard part about it. Um, so, you know, there are absolutely challenges that we would try to get the folks. And, and there's also a misconception that, that these folks are more likely to commit a crime, which is absolutely statistically not true. Statistically, they're more, more likely crimes, to be the victims of a crime. Yeah, statistically, so, I've heard that. More crimes will be committed against them than they mm -hmm. themselves commit. Abs absolutely. Patricia, I saw a lot of head, head nodding. Um, <laughs> earlier, earlier, you said that your son was kind of an outlier, but I know that you've also worked a lot with NAMI. Uh, the, the National Alliance for Mentally Ill. Yes. Is the kind of stuff that Mark and Christine and Kelly have been talking about um, a solution, part of the solution? Uh, can uh, I'll ask it again. Can we build our way out of this? I'm very hopeful that we can. Uh, NAMI's whole purpose is to help families that have loved ones with the mental illness go through the journey. And I, that's what I call it. I call it a journey. And from, from the beginning, I've always said, if I can no longer help my son because he's at near the end of his journey, I want to be able to help other families. So NAMI, to me, when I first discovered them, was such an important part of my support group because I didn't have any support when this first started 20 odd years ago. I didn't know where to go. Uh, people were telling me just let them go and, you know, let the mm. state take them over and wash your hands because, you know, you're not going to get anywhere with this. I am hopeful that one day we will see that people that need housing are going to have the housing, that they're going to have the uh, support systems, that they're going to have programs for them to go to, that medications will be improved. Um, I, I just remain hopeful. NAMI is a wonderful group to help families go through this journey. We have support groups. 
Um, I co-facilitate a support group the third Wednesday of the month. I have been on the board for numerous years um, and I'm just gonna keep going on my journey. Um, and like I said, if I can't help him, I'm gonna work on helping other people because there are a lot of people out there that need help. And on the Wednesdays, you'd be surprised how many new people come to support group that just don't even know where to go. They don't know where to start. They don't know who to contact. And that's what NAMI does. We help our families find some solutions. Kelly, talk about the, the range of services and I guess indirectly the range of needs. Um, mm -hmm. You can, you can start adding more beds, you can start adding more buildings, but some of them probably will only deal with alcoholism. Some of them will probably only deal with mental illness. Some of them will probably only deal with substance abuse. Um, are you specialized enough that you have sliced it into little chunks and need more of each piece of the pie? No, well, we recognize that uh, most individuals, as mentioned earlier, they're going to have, they could have any combination of mental illness and or substance use. So any housing that we're involved in, um, it includes bedding and housing support for either or. And so I don't think, um, you know, I was thinking when you were asking, can we build ourselves out of this? Yeah. I don't know that we can or not, but I'm willing to try. I want to do it. it. You know, I just look back at our nine years ago when I started at Best Self, it was Lakeshore then. Um, I used to oversee one of our facilities. And when the women and children recovered from their mom had a substance use and mental illness in most cases. And I remember one little girl said, Miss Kelly, are you gonna make us go to the shelter? It was a treatment facility. And so once treatment and recovery happened by state regulation, we have to discharge because that's not a housing facility. But that's hard to have to someone go through treatment, they become stable, and then they go to a shelter. So we made a commitment. I made a commitment that I'm going to do my part to make sure we bring more safe, affordable housing for people who have mental illness and or substance use, because that's not acceptable. That's not acceptable. How do you get people into the facility? Christine, I want to bring you in in a second, because I've heard that that a lot of the folks that are homeless are perhaps that way by choice. Kelly, you've got a facility, you've got beds, you have people in need, how do you get them in? So if they uh, contact our, probably the easiest way to get in is to contact our main number of the 884-0888. Um, and that's our intake department. And once they know that they're looking for housing, they'll link them to the right department. Um, we also have outreach staff who are canvassing the city. They go to the shelters. We, they work a lot with some street homeless individuals who choose to stay um, on the street and they engage them and work with them to hopefully get them to a point where they're willing to accept housing. Um, and we have what are called peers. Um, those are people with lived experience who also work with us and they help to engage individuals as well. Um, who are suffering from mental health or substance use and who are in need of housing. Is it hard to get someone to talk, talk about what the outreach person does? Is it hard to get someone in your facility in your facility? Well, it can be. It depends. A lot of it, you know, uh, someone who, well, for a couple different reasons. One, most of our, our beds are full. I think we do have some. We just uh, was funded for a rapid rehousing, um, 40 beds. Uh, within the past couple months. So we have some housing available through that, but many of our units are full, which is why we're building. And then you have the, in, the engaging and building trust and relationship. Sometimes if, if someone has paranoid schizophrenia, they may have a fear of going into uh, living into an apartment and they feel safer outside on the street. Well, the outreach workers will go meet them where they are, maybe bring them food, clothing, and try to build relationships with these individuals so that they begin to trust and see if they will agree to then accept some level of housing with additional supports. The yeah, story, if I can jump in. Yeah, I was gonna. I was just gonna come to you. The story that Patricia um, said at the top was substandard housing. You have done research on people who have no housing. Yeah. So one of the things that Kelly's team is particularly good at um, is engaging the folks on the streets. And what I have been told, and what comes up a lot, is 
people who refuse to come inside, it's not so much they're choosing to be homeless, it's that they think homelessness is better than some imagined other option. So maybe they're afraid to accept help because they're not ready to let go of a substance use issue. Maybe their symptoms um, of schizophrenia are leading them to believe that being inside is a dangerous place. So a lot of that relationship building and trust building and is so important and to show them that like, um, particularly with like the Housing First Homeless programs, like we will take you as you are, we will work with you as you are. Um, it will take some time and it's really a lot of like the outreach workers are so good at that relationship side and I respect that the work they do so much. And there's hardly anybody who's been on the street of Buffalo for more than a year um, because of the work of outreach workers with this mindset for the Housing First programs. Um, challenge of Housing First programs, they're usually scattered site apartments. So if you are an individual who needs more supervision, it's not necessarily going to be the right fit for you. But I have seen it be a place of transition for someone who wouldn't even talk to somebody at first because of their symptoms. Am I stereotyping to say that many or, or most of the homeless in West New York are mentally ill? What is, what's the, the two circles of that Venn diagram? I really should have come prepared with that chart uh, study <laughs> before I came here. It's a lot of people. I don't know if I would say most just because um, most homeless people are homeless because of financial crises. Financial crises can contribute to a mental health break. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I would say it's not always the symptoms that contribute to the homelessness. A lot of times it's the lack of money. Okay. And and there's a difference also... between that ahead, situational Mark. homelessness where it's short term, somebody lost the yeah. job, they lost you know, their house going down, that they, they, they find themselves, you know, with this whole COVID type of thing. I think if you talk about the long-term chronic type of homeless person, that I think you will see that the preponderance of mental illness and or substance abuse is, is statistically very high. Um, so I think Christine makes a very good distinction. You know, there's, there's that short-term situational homeless person who, <laughs> you know, but for circumstances beyond their control, in most cases, um, you know, find themselves on in the street. That person who chooses to be out there, particularly with somebody with paranoia, is feeling safe out there. I mean, you would think that's almost counterintuitive to feel safer on the street, but um, it's, it's sometimes not. I yeah, and I would jump in to add that, like for the chronic homelessness that Mark's describing, um, the permanent supportive housing beds that we um, use to help those folks, two thirds of them are mental health beds. Mm. And then okay. the rest of them are kind of generalist, any problem that you have that you need help with. But there's a reason that two thirds of them are mental health beds. Right. I imagine too, you said earlier, there's a resistance to be a part of the system. Um, part of me understands that intrinsically, but I also say this is Buffalo and it gets cold here. Um, at what point do you say, the street is not for me? I can't do this, this is cold. And it, it crosses that line where they will overcome reluctance to be a part of the system. I gotta give a shout out to Restoration Society on this one because okay. they've been operating a low barrier code blue shelter. So any day that it's under 32 degrees, uh, Restoration Society's got their doors open, they send out people in the community and they are very, very successful in getting people to come inside. And part of the reason they're very successful is they're using that um, radical acceptance, that trust building, uh, stuff like that. And those shelters are often um, some of the first places of engagement for a lot of folks where it's like, okay, you know, you're here, you've been coming here, so you know, we're here to help you and then to kind of move forward and they do really good work. For those who don't know, let's talk a little bit about Restoration Society. Let's explain who they are. Um, I don't know who, who gets to jump in here. Maybe you, Patricia. They have clubhouses. They're kind of like a day treatment center. Am I anywhere close? They got a lot. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Christine. Go ahead. Um, so they absolutely do have those uh, clubhouses that you described, which fulfill a lot of the social needs and the community that's so important that Patricia was speaking so eloquently. Quintly too. Um, 
they also have housing programs and that's pretty much what I'm familiar with. They have um, scattered site apartments, very similar to how um, Kelly's programs operate. They have the, uh, um, co they had a COVID shelter open um, when a lot of the other shelters had the um, capacity cut in half due to social distancing requirements, they opened that. Um, they have the shelters for Code Blue. There's Harbor House, which is a drop-in center that's open overnight for people with mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, they operate rapidly housing, the coordinated entry system for the homeless folks, they do that as well. And I'm sure Patricia can talk to the rest of their uh, programming much more eloquently than I can. But they're not a treatment provider. And, okay. and in, 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 the, in the way that you, you mentioned, like a day treatment, um, they're not a licensed treatment provider. They're more of um, a, a psychosocial support. Community housing. and socialization. And so there's, um, you know, we, uh, for the first time, uh, in the system, and we have it posted on our website. We have it posted at the two one one. We have um, mapped the the system, and it's never been done before, um, not even in the state. And so we've shared it. Uh, it goes out to about five hundred people uh, in organizations every time we update it. And we keep getting new information from it, and it was an uh, it was a learning journey even for us who have been in the field for a year or two. Um, that say, uh, you know, what's out there. So, um, you know, so anybody can go either to our website. Um, and I also believe that it's at posted, I think probably in best selves, it may well be. I know it's posted at 211 United Way and, and it says the adult system of care map and it's, and it's, it's on an Excel spreadsheet, but if you just go, it, it there's a big, there's a big, the, the single biggest page actually is the housing page. Um, and shout out to Christine, who was a huge part of help put that page together. But that page, um, in that, when we call it a map, it almost looks like an organizational chart is what it looks like. But the very first page is um, all the websites of over 180 organizations. So if you go to that site, um, you'll see the very first thing you'll say is web page, home page. And so on the later pages, you'll see like all these organizational charts, and it'll show you. Here's, this is the type of service. This is the broad category. These are the subcategories of it. And underneath it is who does it? What agency does what, including all sorts of housing, all sorts of treatment, support, reintegration, family support, everything. NAMI is in there. And then on the first page is the website to go to right to their place. It's a live okay. active link. They'll take you right there and, and, and show you the real depth and breadth of what's out there. Because a lot of the difficulty here is that people make the assumption that there's not much out there and that's really not the case. Is it adequate? Are we there yet? No. Will we ever be there? I am i don't know what there is. I look at it as a journey, um, but I can tell you in, in, in my time of, of going from being an overnight counselor at PSI and doing crisis services and 40 years later doing this job, what we have, the, the, the safety net that we have is not complete. We're always improving it, but there is a lot there that it really helps. And, and sometimes it's confusing for people to know what these terms mean and who does what. And that's why it's helpful. You know, that's why I'm a huge believer in, in NAMI. And everything Patricia said, she was she was spot on because the 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 feeling of loneliness and isolation and the overwhelming sense of that mental illness taking over the family, you know, and then the family is revolving around the person because you're almost dreading when they come in. Who am I going to see today? Are they stable or are they not? And, and, and in some ways, for those folks who have those family members with a very severe mental illness, it's, it's like a grieving process that never stops because do I get to see my son today or do I get to see this person who doesn't know who I am and is you know, responding to internal stimuli and that kind of thing. So the, the, the system right now, particularly because right now with COVID, you have people who are being challenged with mental health issues that have never had them in the past. Okay. And, and so the system is trying to rise to that while still not trying to lose these folks who have had chronic ongoing problems, uh, you know, both on the mental health and the substance abuse side. 
I want to talk directly to the viewers. We've got about 15 minutes left. If you have a question, enter it right in on your screen. We will try to get to it. We have had a couple of comments come in. Uh, the first one here, a viewer in Toronto commented that all the things that you've talked about here in West New York, it turns out are also an issue in a city like Toronto. That same viewer wonders if the Corporation for Supportive Housing funds any of the housing units that have been discussed here. Is that a, a body that you're in any way familiar with? I'm familiar with it. It may be um, Canadian, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, yeah, it's a big organization. I'm more familiar with their technical assistance, but in our community, it's all um, local. And like when I say local, I mean local to Western New York. So mm -hmm. like DePaul might be based in Rochester, but you know, that's right. still Western New York um, providers. So uh, Best Self Restoration Society, DePaul, TSI, style, uh, Southern Tier Environments for Living, uh, BFNC, Recovery Options Made Easy. I'm very concerned that I'm forgetting somebody right now. Well, obviously Best Self. Um, they're all local organizations. Mm -hmm. I want to take a, a minute as, as we wind down here. And again, if there are questions, we'll certainly get to them. But the one topic I don't think we've touched adequately enough is stigma. If there was no stigma, would there still be these problems? How much of, and Patricia, maybe you get to kick it off, how much of the problems that your son has had with landlords are because people just don't get it? I think there are people that are trying to understand, but a lot of times, like in our situation, there are times where he presents himself in a very odd way. And so people are afraid. They're afraid when they see him and he doesn't, I don't want to say he doesn't look normal because what today is normal, mm -hmm. but he does, his appearance is disturbing at times. When he is talking to himself or what I call talking to himself, but he's talking to whoever is speaking to him in his head. Mm -hmm. So that is scary to some people. So they back off. They don't want to say, hey, do you need help? They go the other way. That is, that stigma. That I don't know if it's ever going to go away. You know, there's a long way to go on working on stigma. Uh, same question, I guess, Kelly. Uh, earlier, earlier, I, my, my construction was, can we build ourselves out of this? If we're talking about stigma, can we, can we educate ourselves out of this? I wish, I, I hope we, we, I hope the answer to that would be yes. I have learned and am learning that stigma is, still very, very present and real. And as we uh, go on this journey to developing housing, um, we come up against it quite often. I think people, many people have this mind or image of mental health as the most extreme case. And, you know, someone who's violent and aggressive and the majority of the individuals with severe mental illness, that's not, you know, the right. situation. And so trying to educate people on, um, as I think Mark said earlier, you know, mental health, it does not discriminate. You know, anyone can be impacted by it. And we are also invested in making sure everyone is safe. And so we're not looking to put, you know, we do, and we work with severely mentally ill individuals. And sometimes people become very symptomatic and they need additional support. And so we're not looking to put dangerous people into housing to disrupt neighbors and do things. Um, but that's the image that I think comes to mind when people start hearing that you're looking to build housing and safe, affordable housing that would allow individuals with severe mental illness or substance use to live in. Um, and it's, it's disheartening. Um, we try to educate. Uh, we've even like with community meetings, we have uh, many advocates uh, who have gone through the system, some who are still in treatment services. They also come to try to help people put a face to um, some, you know, uh, some individuals with severe mental illness hold very good jobs, you would not know. And as long as their symptoms are managed, some people fall on. So it's like trying to break people's image of what a person with severe mental illness may look like. Um, but it's, I, it's, I I don't want to give the, the stigma credence, but I want to be able to understand it. 
you're, you have a community meeting, you're building a new apartment complex. What do you hear? What do people say? We don't want you here. <laughs> that happens quite often. We don't want you here. We have children here. You're uh, going to bring down my property value. Uh, these people are not safe to live here. So all of those, um, I guess, you know, like I said, it's disheartening to hear that. And we try to educate and, and reinforce that everyone deserves safe, affordable housing. And we're going to support individuals to be successful in the housing. And we're not looking to, you know, say we want, we want the individuals we're putting in to be successful. So we're going to do everything to make that happen. And we want the neighbors to be happy um, and to not be disrupted as well. But yeah, you hear a lot of negative, unpleasant comments. And if and, I may jump in because please. of my, like, I actually live walking distance of a licensed mental health health facility and I live biking distance of another and because of my position I happen to know that there's a lot of people in scattered site apartments who also live nearby to me and so I would say from my own personal experience being a mother who lives in the community with her two small kids I haven't had any problems with that um you know for the folks who are getting help and in the cases in my life where I have had issues with somebody who had mental illness, they weren't getting the supports that somebody in um, Kelly's program is getting or um, any of the other programs. Like you want the members of our community who need the help to get the help and just as a community, like taking care of each other is going to lead to a better outcome. Um, because when they have those supports and you know the symptoms starting to show, there's somebody that you can call who cares about them and who knows how to help them. And that's a far better neighbor situation than somebody who doesn't have somebody to call to help or when their symptoms going, they're disconnected from the assistance that they need. And then it's like, well, what do I do then? I've been in both situations and I would far rather be a neighbor to uh, any of the programs that Kelly or the other providers run. Um, you know, I live by a, SRO and I've never had any struggles with the people who live there. So, you know, if people are afraid of that, I would uh, let, let me just ask, what is an SRO? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, That's okay. It's a single resident occupancy building. So it's like 80 beds. The buildings are beautiful, um, but it's pretty much a single site facility where people who have serious mental illness can live and there's 24 hour staff. Okay. So counselors always there people always there. Is there a place in all of it? Uh, Patricia, looks like I was about to cut you off. Do you have something to add? No, no, I'm okay. fine. <laughs> your, your screen lit up. You know how when, when it goes hey, off hey, mute. I, I would want to add for, on this, before please. you get off the of stigma, um, Erie County has a very active anti-stigma coalition. Mm -hmm. You've mm -hmm. probably um, seen some of the ads. You see the microphone out there. And I think their website, I believe is let's talk stigma.org. That is Yep, yep. Um, and, you know, really education is really the key. And, you know, mental illness is um, it's not ubiquitous. It's 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 an overarching term, um, but there's still people. And, you know, there are certain ways that um, with a little education, for example, if you see somebody who is experiencing some difficulties, um, as Patricia talked about, you know, she said her, her, um, her son may have been talking to himself. Well, he wasn't talking to himself, she's absolutely right. He was talking to the, the voices. voices. The thing hear. is, you're experiencing that as something outside of that. Well, there's very reasonable ways to approach that person. And one of the things that people with a little education, they know that you, you, you control the tone and volume of your voice. You you announce yourself to the person, speak in very measured tones, and and you try to, for example, with schizophrenia, is one of the keys is to make one change at a time, deal with one issue at a time, go very straightforward with it because schizophrenia, for example, is a disease of the brain. So imagine yourself sitting here in your office right now the bus is outside people are talking the fire alarm's going off and all that's happening at the same time 
while you're trying to listen to whatever the person is in front of you is saying something while that voice inside you is saying to you, you're stupid, you're an idiot, don't trust this person or something like that, and then try to concentrate on what that person is saying. That's why there's ways to approach that person. And that's very scary for the person who's experiencing things. The good thing about it is the, the medications that are in play now, the second and third generation antipsychotics are much more effective um, for, for people who, who do that. So stigma is a huge, huge thing, but it's not something that people need to be afraid of with a little bit of understanding. I, I want to make sure we have room for one more question that just came in. And I, I want to give you each a, a chance for some closing remarks. But if we're talking about housing, um, so far we have not discussed the ADA or all the vast housing discrimination laws and rules that are on the book. Is there a role here for that? Um, you know, I, certainly, you know, the, the Americans with Disabilities Act and mental illness is recognized as, as, a, dis as a disability. And, um, you know, if somebody can uh, afford um, the, the, the housing and, and whatever, you know, they should have the same rights that anybody else have. And so the ADA does, does apply just in the same way as you have other anti-discrimination laws apply, whether you're, um, you know, you're applying to, to uh, minority populations of color. Okay. And I will say that our, as we look to build housing, we do pay attention to that. We've actually, we've met with um, members of, uh, most recently was the Blind Association where they uh, educated us on designing apartments that were uh, that would meet their needs. And in some cases where we thought we were after explaining um, what was needed and what wasn't. So it's very much so has a space in here. All right, uh, a viewer wrote in, and this is probably reacting to some of the things that Patricia said earlier. It is very difficult to be admitted to any institution like the Buffalo Psychiatric Center because the trend by the state and across the country is more closure of beds. Mark, you touched on it a little bit. Patricia, I yeah. know you did as well. Um, I, I, can, I can speak to that. And, um, and, and just to clarify, and, and may Patricia, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you know, your, your son, if, if I may, he wasn't in the Buffalo Psychiatric Center for all those years, was he? He was in the RACA for many of those years? He was at the Buffalo Psych Center for a year and a half, was discharged, went along his life, and then was in the psych center about a year and a half ago. Okay. So, so he's, he's been in twice already and has been released twice to a rock a setting. And now with what is going on now with him, I don't see him getting any better he's just kind of there just kind of out there um, right. and a rocket yeah. is a resident a rocket is a residential care center for adults okay Correct. we 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 have just enough time to kind of go around the horn and get some closing remarks uh kelly we'll start with you kelly dumas from best self yes i just want to close by saying everyone is deserving of safe affordable housing and so we're doing our part to try to make that possible. If you are in need of housing services, you can reach out uh, to our 716-884-0888 and we will assist you. All right, uh, Christine Slocum with the Erie County Department of Mental Health. Thank you for having me. Um, I would echo what Kelly is saying, like we do this work because we care about the folks in our community who have mental illness as valued members of our community. And if you, anyone who's listening is trying to figure out how to help somebody, um, you can reach out to me. My number is 858-8539. Again, 858-8539. All right, and Mark O'Brien, the Erie County Commissioner of Mental Health. Well, Dave, I wanna thank you for having having all of us here on, on this and you know and I do want to credit Patricia because we we have all worked in this but she this is a lived thing for her and and my hat goes off to her to to take that lived experience and really to put it to helping other people that's just that's really just what it's all about and um, really it's it's a safety net that um, is not where 
it wants. We want it to be yet, but it continues to expand, improve, and the more people keep talking and reach out for help and understand that these are folks who uh, need help and, and, and are entitled to a, a life like everybody. All right. Um, that, it's coming in at the very last bit here. I think we might be able to squeeze in one more question. Um, a viewer was released after 21 years inpatient at New York State Office of Mental Health, has had sir, a horrific experience, no satisfactory outcome from the agencies who can help them. Any, any quick referrals? With, with, the, with the limited amount of time we have. I would have, I would have them call the mental health department here. And um, as Christine talked about, it's 858-8530. And uh, there's any number of folks here that can get on the horn with, with this person or the family member and help guide them to, we have a very rich system, hoping to get it richer, but we can help them. And the specifics will be very helpful. Christine, All right, very good. Me, or Kelly? No, Kelly, yeah. did, you, did you want to jump in too, Kelly? No, just echo what Mark said. All right, that will then do it. Thank you all four of you for being here. Uh, thanks to everyone thank who is, is viewing and watching. Uh, I also would like to say a thank you to our Education and Outreach Director, Beth Brankowiak. She kind of produced this thing. Technical Director, Aaron Heverin. Engineering support from Tom Vogel. And of course, again, our panel, Mark O'Brien, Christine Slocum from the Erie County Department of Mental Health, Kelly Dumas from Best Self Behavioral Health, and Patricia Seifert with the Buffalo NAMI chapter. Thank you all. Uh, this has been a production of Buffalo Toronto Public Media. Our mental health initiative is supported by the Patrick P. Lee Foundation. I'm WBFO News Director Dave Debo. We're on Twitter at WBFO, online at WBFO.org. Thank you all. Have a great night.